I saw there. I saw there was a question about interpretation. Um, please um, look on the screen. There will be um, a slide that shows you how to um, start interpretation. To let us know if you have questions or have trouble. Hi, everyone. It is eleven thirty while we wait for a few others to join. Um, I'll just uh, repeat what Kasha mentioned. Uh, please um, go ahead and use the chat to introduce yourself and um, to comment um, amongst each other. I'm Allison Gray. I'm with the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health. And I will just start um, by thanking Family Voices of California for inviting me to be here today to moderate today's session that's focused on California Children's Services, both um, classic and whole child model programs. And um, thank you, Kasha, for helping out in behind the scenes with this session. Kasha is um, Assistant Director and Operations Programs at uh, Family, Resource, uh, Family Resource Navigators, and will be helping out with the chat and the Q&A today. Um, if you attended the morning session, um, I'll just repeat that uh, we are asking attendees to use the Q&A function for questions for panelists and presenters and to use the chat for um, other comments or sharing resources or um, you know, talking, talking to each other. And that, that worked really well this morning. Um, Pip has already mentioned in the chat, but I will say it as we're uh, waiting for others to join. The, the sessions are recorded. They will be available on the Family Voices website, I believe in about a week's time. Um, that includes recordings and slides. Um, one other bit of housekeeping, um, our interpreter for this session is Armando. Um, Armando, are you going to come off mute to provide any instructions around interpretation for this session? Hey, uh, gracias. Bienvenidos a todos. Um, Maybe we can put that slide up uh, again uh, to access interpretation, and I'll go ahead and say it in Spanish. Este, para los que están aquí que necesitan servicio de interpretación, yo soy el intérprete y vamos a poner en la pantalla las instrucciones cómo pueden acceder. Este, no sé si estuvieron aquí temprano, ya saben, o si están de aquí de nuevo, vamos a poner las instrucciones en la pantalla. Kusha, are you able to put up the slide for interpretation uh, yes. instructions? There we go. So Armando, um, we have the interpretation slide up. 
Ok. Aquí ven en la pantalla las instrucciones para si necesitan eh, interpretación. Eh, primero en el control de seminarios web que está abajo de la pantalla. Haga clic en donde dice interpretación. Uh, después sigan las instrucciones. Haga clic en el idioma. Sería español. Y este, ahí me pueden escuchar. Y si están conectándose por medio de un teléfono, también este, pueden hacer lo mismo. Hagan clic en la pantalla de interpretación y escojan el idioma español. Gracias. Thank you so much, Armando. And just as a reminder to our speakers and panelists um, to please speak in a, um, clearly and, and slowly so that uh, we can help with our interpretation services. So let's uh, go ahead and get started. Um, Katie, if you want to pull up the initial slide, I'm going to I'm going to start by just providing a brief overview of um, today's panel and and briefly introducing our speakers uh, for for additional details around our speakers' experience and expertise. You can go to the speaker profiles. Hoy. Mm, Armando, we can hear you um, in the general room. Zoom room. Okay. Can you hear so me? our um, first speaker today will be Courtney Maslin, Chief of Integrated Systems of Care Division with the Department of Healthcare Services. Courtney will set the context for today's panel with an overview of California services and whole child model including um, some of the department's future plans for California. the programs. Oh, Armando, we can still hear you oh. in the general room. So, uh, somebody from the other end has to put me into the interpretation room because oh. I don't have, I can't do that on my end. Oh, okay. Um, Hi, Allison. Uh, Holly is coming right now to go ahead and make sure that interpretation is working correctly. I apologize that's, for interrupting everybody. That's okay. Let's wait for Holly. Hold on tight, everybody. We all have to appreciate the sophistication of putting on a virtual conference like this with concurrent breakout rooms and um, interpreter services, just really incredible. So yes, absolutely. found to be a little hiccup here and there. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Vamos a esperar un momento para, uh, Empezar los servicios de interpretación. Lento. If you are just joining us, we are just waiting for interpretation. Um, to get our interpretation going um, and then we'll get started. Thanks, Kasha. There is a question in the chat about whether the transcript will be available. I know the recordings and the slides are available. I am not sure about the transcript. Yeah, we can check with Pip on that. We can find out, yeah. I think you're right, Patty, in the chat. Patty says, I think this group is filled with more patience and flexibility. 
than any other audience. I saw that too and had to agree. <laughs> <laughs> Holly is coming into the room right now. I apologize. We had to fix it for a couple of the different sessions. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for your patience with this large scale technology. A little bit difficult when we have multiple translators going on, but we will get it fixed. And we appreciate it. Gracias por su paciencia. Ya vamos a corregir este y empezar cuando ya tengamos los servicios de interpretación. And Lori, this doesn't mean you get to talk faster. Nick, we had one question in the chat about the transcript and whether or not it's, it will be available on the website with the other materials. Do you know the answer to that? So the downloaded uh, the videos and things of that nature uh, will be available on the website once I'm done uh, editing everything, uh, making sure that we're all set up and ready to go. The transcript of uh, the entire call, uh, when it, this is done, it will send a copy to me. Um, and if someone would like the transcript, they're more than welcome to email me and then I can send them the transcript. But I will be posted because the entire transcript could be hundreds of pages long. Um, so if they would like that, they're more than welcome to reach out to me and I'll be happy to go ahead and, and send that to them. Uh, but it won't be available on our website or anything like that. Okay. And can they find your email? Um... Yeah, they uh, on the my, website. Me, yeah, absolutely. On the okay. um, it's the about us, and then there's just three of us, me, Elaine, and uh, and Pip. But I'll be more than happy to put it in the chat right now if you'd like, and then that way everyone has it. Thanks, yeah. Courtney. I see a kitty cat. <laughs> There you go. It looks like your language interpretation has been language interpretation available. Looks like it's been fixed. Okay, let's jump in. I will uh, go very quickly through introductions. I want to give as much time as possible to the actual presentations. Today's panel will start with Courtney Maslin from the Chief Integrated System. She's the Chief of Integrated Systems of Care Division, the Department of Healthcare Services. Courtney is going to set the context for today's panel. She'll provide an overview of California Children's Services and Whole Child Model. This will include um, some of the department's future plans for the programs, um, some of the Whole Child Model evaluation, and also um, some information around CCS monitoring and oversight. Following the department's perspective, our panelists will share current challenges and opportunities with the whole child model or um, classic CCS program from their own perspectives. And we are going to hear from um, two uh, parents with lived experience. They have children in uh, classic CCS or whole child model. The first will be Daisy Dominguez. Daisy is the parent to Jimena. She 
is the Early Start Program Manager at Family Resource Navigators in Alameda County. And the second parent will be Yana Espinoza. Yana is parent to Cora. She um, lives in a whole child model county. She's a member of the whole child model uh, family advisory committee network. She's the chair of the whole child model FAC in her um, at, uh, Central California Alliance for Health. And following the family perspective, we'll hear from Lori Soman, whom you um, uh, may have seen uh, during this morning's presentation. Lori uh, represents Children's Regional Integrated Service System. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, this is a collaborative of 31 county CCS programs, provider organizations, and family organizations in Northern California. Lori is the director of CRIS, also a senior policy analyst at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. She's going to share um, identify challenges and opportunities relating to the whole child model specifically. We will then hear from Erin Kelly, who is the executive director of the Children's Specialty Care Coalition. She is um, representing pr the provider perspective today. She's going to walk us through um, recently introduced legislation, SB 424, and you'll um, get to hear all about that from Erin. And then, um, our panel will uh, round out with Alicia Emanuel, the senior attorney of National Health Law Program. So bringing in the legal perspective, she's going to share top 10 things for CCS families to know about the unwinding, um, unwinding the Medicaid continuous coverage requirement. So as you can see, we have a fantastic panel with a wide range of topics and viewpoints today. Um, just, there may be um, different, differing viewpoints, different angles. Um, before we get started, I just want to remind and emphasize uh, in the spirit of Family Voices and the Health Summit that this, um, the CCS children and, and whole child model children and families really are at the center and at the core of this discussion, which I think is going to be very rich and engaging. Um, and the other point I wanted to just to make sure I touch on is while we do have a wide range of perspectives, we do not have anybody on the panel specifically from uh, CCS County Agency or whole, or whole Child Model Plans. So if there are any administrators or staff in um, attendance today, you're welcome to contribute to the um, discussion through the, the chat and the Q&A. And Pip is reminding us all to speak slowly for the interpreter. So I would like to share that again as well. And um, finally, once again, the Q&A is for questions for our panelists. You may um, direct specific questions to a specific panelist by including their name in your question. We are going to hold all um, questions until the question and answer section at the end. And um, with that, I think we can go ahead and start with Courtney. Thanks, Allison. And thank you all for having us from the department here to speak on this important issue. Um, first, I'm going to go through um, the California Children's Services Program. Next, I'll go through the whole child model program and then get into um, the focused discussion on some of the initiatives and upcoming items. Next slide, please. Okay, as you mostly are aware, probably, the California Children's Services Program provides diagnostic and treatment services, medical case management, and physical and occupational therapy services to children under the age of 12 with CCS eligible conditions. Um, CCS also provides medical therapy services that are delivered at the public schools. Um, CCS eligible conditions include, but are not limited to, chronic medical conditions such as cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, cerebral palsy, heart disease, cancers, traumatic injuries, infectious diseases, and, um, and all of them are outlined um, in state regulation. The CCS program is administered as a partnership between the county health departments and the California Department of Healthcare Services. There are two distinct models. Um, 
There is the independent model, which means that the county runs the program, and then the dependent model, which is a partnership between the county and DHCS in order to uh, facilitate the authorizations as well as um, facilitate the program as a whole. Next slide, please. I want to highlight a few policy initiatives we are working on for the CCS program as a whole and how they interplay with our whole child model plan partners. So under CalAIM, which is our California Advancing Innovation and Medi-Cal Initiative, um, this also holds things like our Enhanced Care Management Program, as well as others, really um, working towards DHS and counties working collaboratively through the CCS and monitoring oversight work group. Our main goals for this effort is increased accountability for the counties, standardization of the CCS program statewide, and overall um, improved quality of care and experience with the ability to file grievances. Really the main goals of this effort are really to ensure that there are mechanisms that are comparable to um, the mechanisms that are available in other healthcare delivery systems and ensuring that if you're in one county in the state, you're getting comparable care. Knowing that there are regional differences and case management is per person specific, but being able to ensure that we can have that systematic approach to CCS um, in order to increase our ability to have standardized care. Um, the work group is working to establish and implement and evaluate statewide performance, quality, and reporting standards for the county administration of the CCS program. So this is really looking at performance um, of ensuring you know, timely access to visits and making sure that there's that visit to a special care center, um, looking at ensuring that there's um, a systems of checks and balances to ensure that if there's increased grievances um, that or complaints that the county is doing, um, taking action to address them, as well as other aspects that are still in the process of being worked through. Um, our CCS monitoring and oversight work group is closed. However, um, anyone from the public can listen in and there is a public comment period at the end. Our next meeting is next week um, and the information is available on the DHCS website if you're interested. I can pop um, some information in the chat after I'm done speaking. Um, additionally, for CCS children who need social services supports and meet eligibility criteria for ECM and or community supports, they'll be available through the managed care plans to further assist CCS clients and families. And this is um, for our CCS clients, but also our whole child model clients. The community supports differ um, depending on the county you're in and the plan you're in. You're, um, uh, uh, assigned to, but enhanced care management starting in July 1 of 2024 will be available to all kids that meet the eligibility criteria. Um, Dr. Natsui gave some information this morning Hope in that session. Hopefully we're all able to listen in to understand more about what that entails and how um, CCS kids and whole child, models, whole child model children can qualify. Next slide, please. So I wanted to kind of talk about the whole child model in the current state. So um, if you're tracking, there was a Senate bill a few years ago that authorized the Department of Healthcare Services to establish the whole child model program in designated county organized health systems and regional health authority counties. Really what this means to say is there's a single plan in those counties. So this exists in, I'm trying to go as slow as possible. Um, this is, allowing for the, this is where the county runs the singular plan in the county and thus has oversight over more than a two plan county would have because they have decided to have a county organized health system. Um, in 2026, um, we started the process to implement the whole child model program and the whole child model program was fully implemented in 2019. The whole child model approach is meant to meet six goals of the CCS redesign, which is implement patient and family-centered approach, improve care coordination through an organized delivery system, maintain quality, streamline care delivery, build on lessons learned, and be cost-effective. The approach is consistent with the primary goals of providing comprehensive treatment and focusing on the whole child, including the child's full range of health care needs rather than just their CCS eligible condition. As a result of the implementation in 2019, there are 21 counties and five Medi-Cal managed care health plans that participate in the whole child model. Wanted to highlight a few um, items that are for the whole child model in the future state. Um, there was an assembly bill in 2022 and the direct contract memo that requires Kaiser to implement the California Children's 
California Children's Services Full Child Model Program in counties where full child model is already in operation. Um, examples include um, Orange, um, in partnership counties, Central California Alliance Health for counties, as well as CCH counties, California, Central California Alliance for Health. This is really to ensure that there's continuity care that can be maintained, as it will allow for children and families that previously had Kaiser the ability to stay with Kaiser for their healthcare coverage, including CCS. So this is not available to all clients in those, in those counties, but it is available to the clients that have a pre-existing relationship. This is really to ensure that if you're coming into the CCS whole child model program and you're in one of those counties to really ensure that you have that care coordination and that continued coverage. Um, this will be um, the rest of the um, children in whole child model counties will stay with their CCS case manager as in the whole child model plan and stay with their existing providers. This would be just for people who have the pre-existing relationship with Kaiser. Um, we will be, the department will be working with Kaiser throughout this year um, to work to have them uh, do plan readiness for implementation in 2024. And they will be held to the same standards as the whole child model managed care plans, um, including network readiness activities, as well as um, compliance activities to ensure that they can operate the whole child model program starting on January 1, 2024. Next slide, please. The whole child model proposal in alignment with CalAIM core principles to standardize benefits and reduce complexity of the varying models of care delivery, DHCS has proposed to implement the whole child model in the 15 counties converting to the county organized health system and single plan counties to conform with policy across all county operating with one plan. What this means for you all is that this will um, proposes through a trailer bill to implement whole child model in counties that are not currently served, but where the, the counties have decided to change their model type. Um, this would be done in uh, two phases. The first phase would happen on January 1, 2024. This would include Calusa, Glen, Nevada, Plumas, Sierra, Sutter, Tahama, Yuba, Mariposa, and San Benito. These counties would transition into Central California Alliance for Health or Partnership Health Plan, um, depending on their region. This will allow for, um, uh, this allows as Partnership and uh, Central California Alliance for Health are already currently whole child model plans. And this allows for them to have the time to build their networks in preparation, but knowing that they already have the systems in place uh, to operate the whole child model programs in the counties they currently serve. There'll be an operational readiness assessment over the next year, and we will be ensuring that they have the network and special care centers to take on these clients. Additionally, there will be a few counties that would implement if the proposal goes as written in 2025. Um, those would be two plan, two counties. Um, there's a single plan. Um, there will be two counties in partnership um, that are currently independent, as well as the single plan models in Alameda and Contra Costa and Imperial. This would allow us a longer runway to ensure that the uh, whole child model, new whole child model participants would be able to be served as these uh, health plans do not currently serve the whole child model program and are currently classic CCS. Um, this would allow for a seamless transition of duties over the next few years with the operational readiness and allow for um, time to um, build networks and increase capacity, as well as being able to understand the whole child model program um, and to be able to implement effectively. Next slide, please. Um, so I wanted to kind of give an update on the whole child model independent evaluation. One of the requirements of the bill that implemented the whole child model program was DHCS was required to conduct an independent evaluation of the whole child model. We contracted with the University of San Francisco to assess the Medi Medi-Cal managed care plan performance of the whole child model and the outcomes of the experience of CCS eligible children participating in the whole child model program including access to primary and specialty care services. Um, the UCSF conducted key informant interviews with the evaluation, including um, interviewing families from both classic and CCS and whole child model counties. Um, 
and we plan to release the whole trial model evaluation report on our website in spring 2023. Um, this really is looking at um, showing the differences as well as um, the um, successes of the whole child model county. Um, it is an independent valuation, which is quite lengthy, but has a lot of great information on um, where the whole child model improved access to care and where there's opportunities for improvement. I'm, I tried to go as slow as I possibly could knowing the time, but I will pass it back to you, Allison, for the next speaker. Thank you, Courtney. That was um, a lot of information. Thank you for providing that background and overview. Um, just as a reminder to attendees that you will have access to the recording and slides. So um, there was a lot of in-depth information there that you'll be able to look, um, look up later. And um, we will turn now to uh, Daisy Dominguez who will share um, a, a family perspective um, in terms of challenges and opportunities with the CCS program. Go ahead, Daisy. Thank you, Allison. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Daisy Dominguez, and I am very honored to be here this morning. Today, I will be sharing my experience with CCS, and I decided to focus my attention around durable medical equipment since it has been a huge part of my daughter's life. Next slide, please. Everyone meet Jimena. She is my spunky little six-year-old who brightens up a room with her contagious smile. Jimena was officially diagnosed with cerebral palsy at age two and a half due to the abnormalities that she had in her brain from developing cysts while I was pregnant. Next slide, please. When Jimena was born, she spent her first month of life in the NICU at Children's Hospital. There, the social workers helped me with the referral process, and she became eligible for CCS at the time. Upon discharge, Jimena was placed on the wait list for the CCS medical therapy unit. So meanwhile, she was getting in-home physical and occupational therapy through our regional center. Around three months old, I noticed that she was not reaching her milestones. And by nine months old, Jimena was still unable to sit independently, which was beginning to make routine tasks like bathing and feeding difficult since she was getting bigger and heavier. I brought up this concern with her occupational therapist at the time, and she educated me about durable medical equipment. She told me that Jimena could be eligible for a special bath chair and a seating device through CCS. The only problem was she was still on the wait list for the MTU. Finally, at 11 months old, she was evaluated by CCS and I asked about equipment. I knew she could use a bath chair and an activity chair, so that's what I asked for. And this is where I first heard the words duplications and denials. I was told that I could get a bath chair, but that instead of an activity chair, I should instead consider a wheelchair, which wasn't in my thoughts at all. One, because she would eventually need it for school since she would most likely not walk. And two, if she got an activity chair, the wheelchair would be considered a duplication of seating equipment. So then they explained to me that the regional center could possibly fund the activity chair, but that I would need to go through the denial process, which seemed too complicated at the time. For a first time parent in the special needs world, this was also confusing. I thought to myself, why can't they just provide what she needs? How is it a duplication if it serves a different purpose? They also explained that if I got a wheelchair, that she couldn't get a feeding chair. So we went with the wheelchair and the bath chair, and she also got a stander, yay, by one year and nine months old. These pieces of equipment, as pictured here, made a huge difference in our lives. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, as a first time parent of a disabled child, I knew nothing, which made it extremely difficult in knowing what to advocate for. There's no menu or equipment guide that I could look at. For example, if it weren't for a home visit that led to the question, how do you get Jimena up the stairs? I would still be struggling to pull her up a step at a time. And I didn't get to put this picture in the slide, but I hope you guys can all see it. This was me putting Jimena up the stairs, literally one step at a time. Now, thankfully, we have ramps in place. 
One challenge I experienced with the wheelchair is the need to break it down and put it back together again at every destination. Imagine running errands and you have to do this multiple times throughout the day. There were many times that I preferred staying home because going out was just too much work. I thought if I could keep a stroller in the car and the wheelchair at home, that would be perfect. As you can see in the pictures, we tried commercial strollers, but they didn't fit her properly nor give her the support she needed. So I asked CCS for a stroller. They told me that I had to go through the denial process because it was a duplication of the wheelchair and ask regional center to fund for it. This time I decided to go for it. So I went through the denial process, which alone took two months, back and forth emails with social workers, the regional center and CCS. While waiting for the stroller, I got creative with what we had and we also borrowed equipment from an organization called Abe Closet. Next slide, please. Here are some photos that show how I got creative and used our equipment for other purposes while we waited. For example, the bath chair also served as a feeding chair, an activity chair, and a modified pool wagon. We checked out the blue stroller in the middle picture from Able Closet and started to get out into the community more since it was faster and easier than the stroller, than the wheelchair. Next slide, please. We overcame obstacles by obtaining denial letters from CCS and using RCEB's services. These pictures to me represent freedom, achievement, and quality of life. After a few months of waiting, we finally received her adaptive stroller that the regional center funded. Jimena loves to be outdoors and her stroller has been on the beach, hiking through the woods, and it's even flown with us to Mexico. For me, obtaining the denial letter from CCS to give the regional center, to give to the regional center was a hassle worth going through. One wish is that families didn't have to go to jump through so many hoops to get the equipment their children need, however. I realized that not all families will go through the hassle of going, to, going through the denial process to obtain much needed equipment. My ability to speak English, write an email, and have the time to figure it all out is a privilege that not everybody has. There is often a sense of gatekeeping around the resources available to our children. And it can also be very confusing when some parents see other children with equipment and when asked for it at their local CCS office, they are told that their child is not eligible. Next slide, please. Overall, however, I am very grateful for the CCS program. It has paid for numerous specialty visits, medications, surgeries, medical equipment, and therapies for my daughter. I would not be able to pay back all of the debt incurred if I had to. I hope that today I was able to highlight both the importance and challenges around obtaining medical equipment for our children. Thank you. And now I'll pass it back to you, Allison. Thank you so much, Daisy, um, for sharing that. It's so encouraging to hear about some of these successes. And I know that a lot of families um, attending today can really um, relate with some of the, the points you brought up around you know, the, not having a menu of services and, um, you know, the, the need to, to advocate and um, challenges you had around requesting some of your DME supplies. So thank you so much for sharing. And um, Yana, we are ready for you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. So my name is Yana Espinosa, and I'm a mom to 15-year-old Maisie and 10-year-old Coraline. Coraline is my medically complicated little chickie. Um, I'm also a substitute teacher, and I'm the chair to Central California Alliance for Health's Whole Child Model Family Advisory Committee, and I more recently gained a seat on the board of Central California Alliance for Health. Um, and while there are positive directions for CCS eligible members within the whole child model health systems, it's still not quite the same as a well-supported and well-staffed classic CCS system. Many of the classic CCS case managers, nurses, providers, directors, everybody had their entire career formed and framed around the unique needs of our very diverse and complex kids. So with this demographic, it's absolutely vital to have knowledgeable staff where mistakes or a lack of understanding can absolutely be detrimental. Um, whole child model unrolling was really scary. I don't think that I'm the only one that was 
honestly really freaked out and upset that they were going to be um, doing that. Um, but um, we already had known what the CCS system looks like. And some of us have been able to experience classic CCS and prior to SB 586. Some of us have now been able to experience the whole child model approach. And some of us are super lucky and got to go backwards back to a dependent county. Um, for those that live in an area where the whole child model has been adopted as care providers, we all had to add teacher or mentor to our title. We had to onboard our health system to what the reality of our populations are. And we've been able to receive robust input from many caregivers during our family advisory committee meetings. Um, so like in these shared spaces, um, communicating about experiences, asking and answering questions, all can be such a positive direction um, to quality of life for children and their caregivers. A uh, natural sort of free flowing of critical information is possible within these brief interactions out in the wild, in meetings and in parking lots. Um, I don't know how many times I've said it, but I've learned more from moms in the bathroom at Lucille Packard than I have anywhere else. The parking lot of the medical therapy unit, the waiting room of the medical therapy unit, and the bathroom at Packard have been key in my understanding and ability to navigate through these systems. It's kind of like we're all these little islands and we all feel like we're separate and we all feel like we're alone and like you can't see anybody else but like all you needed was a boat and you just didn't know that you needed a boat and that there's all these people that are out there that you can have a lot of really great information from so <clears throat> we um we have a lot of room to grow and finding ways to reach those who need the most support we have so many people who are struggling or don't know the rules of the game and they're doing so doing whatever within our power to support other children is of the utmost importance so for with Cora um I had a totally easy breezy chill pregnancy like no problems no issues nothing um and then I had an emergency section and she started life on a helicopter and she had an ASD she had persistent pulmonary hypertension in a newborn failure to thrive intrauterine growth restriction low blood sugar meconium aspiration and a failed algo screening so the algo screening is how we initially got looped in with CCS and like, I'm guessing probably some of you guys probably know her. Um, so like if when you, if you see her high five for me, but the only reason that newborns in California are tested for their hearing is because a mom found out that her son was um, deaf when he was like uh, preschool age because they didn't know that he was deaf because there was no reason that they would have tested for something like that. And I'm sure as a lot of you know, um, early intervention with hearing is of the utmost importance too. So <clears throat> Cora has um, three different CCS qualifying conditions. So when she was born, we were still part of the uh, classic CCS model. And then the Alliance would be for all things unrelated. When we would call to ask for clarification on something with the uh, classic system, or what direction to go, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, staff were all very familiar with this demographic, knew the numbers to call, how the system was structured, what direction to go. At no time did I have to explain any part of life that has been most complicated. I knew our caseworker had all the phone numbers. I knew what to do if I had a DME issue. Can I get the next slide? Is there one that has the map on it? I think maybe it's the one following. Well, we can just go like this then. This is good too. Perfect, awesome. Okay, so that's Cora. And kind of like what Davey, Daisy was just talking about, you can see Cora in her seating device, her eating device and her mobility device. So I had to leave that one in because I find that super annoying. Um, and then can I get the next slide? So um, during COVID times, we lost our housing and we were able to stay with my mom. She lives in Aromas um, within this tiny community, three separate counties joined together. In this picture right here, the three arrows are pointing exactly to where we were, which is in the middle of multiple counties. So <clears throat> one of those counties was a dependent county and that had a huge catastrophic shift in things for Cora. Um, 
we had less availability with the medical therapy unit. We weren't able to work with the same DME vendors. We um, weren't able to um, get, but there was a lot of vendors that didn't want to work with us anymore because of where we were. And that was really frustrating. And unfortunately, what that led to was Cora went for quite a while without getting her um, DME for her feeding stuff. So we actually had to drive to Lucille Packard to get supplies because the DME stuff hadn't been approved yet because San Benito County moves all of their authorizations offsite. None of it's done in that office. It all goes to LA County, which I'm sure is great but it didn't work well for us at all. And it was really, really frustrating. And I made hundreds and hundreds of phone calls trying to figure out what I could do to make sure that our kid could still get the services that she had before. Um, she has a very complicated medical background, like I'm sure a lot of you guys have within your households as well. And her pediatrician has been amazing. She's like a critical component to Cora's care. And because we weren't going to be with the Alliance anymore, because San Benito County does things differently, uh, we were going to lose our pediatrician. Um, that was like, honestly, one of the more devastating things that we've had to deal with. It was, it was really, it was a really ugly time and it was a really stressful time. And I wouldn't go back for any amount of money. It was awful. So when we're dealing with these dependent counties that don't have the same resources or same things that are approved. What that means is that for some of our doctors, they're having to take home work after they leave clinic um, to make sure that their patients are getting the medically indicated DME or prescriptions. And it's not a good use of their time and expertise. Happy care providers who can take a well-needed rest and a break from the intense job of caring for and advocating for our kids are literally better for everybody involved. There's literally no negative on that. Um, I had a hard time getting consistent and cor correct messaging. Cora had an outpatient procedure after we had moved and the entire thing was very challenging. Um, what happened was I was I called the county. The county said, you don't talk to us. You talk to the CCS office. I talked to the CCS office. They said, no, you have to call social security. Called social security. They said, oh no, wrong county of social security. So then I called this other county social security. And then like, I know I'm talking really fast, but like, whether it's in English or anything, none of it makes sense. So I apologize. I'm talking fast, but I'm just trying to get through this. But um, I it was just like one big loop over and over and over where I was getting conflicting information. And one entity is telling me something that the other entity is like, no, that's not true at all. That's not how we do that. Um, and unfortunately, we had to go up to Packard and know that it was possible that we were either going to have to be sent home because it wouldn't be approved or that we could end up getting billed for something. And I'm not exaggerating when I say how heavy it weighed on us to have to um, figure out what's best for our family as a whole. So like this, this, I think that it would be really cool if all the counties were able to go whole child model, um, but only if equal access to care and expertise is offered to every single CCS qualifying member. And that's one of my bigger concerns. And I do not see that happening in some of these counties. I'm excited to see what bringing in more counties will do for whole child model. And I am excited to see forward projection there. Um, and life is hard for everybody. Like no matter what your situation is, life is hard, full stop. It can be brutal. It can be painful. It can be unfair, unimaginable and raw, but it also can be beautiful and exist in a world that you never even knew existed. And it gives you allies and friends that you never would have known otherwise. Um, but if the frustration and the anger can be productive anger, then I know that all of it was worth it. If scary and negative can then shift to empowerment, that is a game changer. And learning to fight and to speak out to get forward momentum has been one of the greatest pleasures of my life. I also very much enjoy hearing so many people that were like essentially same flow as what we opened with, with the um, quote from um, Ayanna Presley. When I was listening to him, I'm like, we're all in this. We know it. Right on. I thank you guys for your time. Thank you so much, Yana. And there's several comments just, um, you know, empathizing with you. And um, I just wanted to echo that. And thank you so much for sharing 
Um, it sounds very frustrating, especially the, the uh, cross county challenges that you experienced. Um, and that is a good transition to you, Lori Soman. Thank you, Katie, for the next slide. And you are on, Lori. Thank you, Allison. Um, and thank you, Daisy and Yana, for sharing your experiences. Obviously, you're, you're the linchpins here. Um, uh, let's go to the next slide. So I've, I've been asked to talk about challenges and opportunities with whole child model. And I'm kind of going back up to the 50,000 foot level of what does this look like more from a state perspective. So uh, Chris uh, developed uh, several issue papers that identified major concerns with whole child model and how it was implemented. Uh, and these problems were identified by our members. And as Allison said, that's the county CCS programs, family support organizations, and CCS provider groups. And uh, for purposes of today, I'm gonna look at uh, three of these areas very quickly. The first and most important is case management for CCS kids. The second is the provision of medical documentation by the whole child model plans to county CCS so they can do their required annual medical review and determine that kids are still medically eligible. And then the third, if we have any time, is, is maintenance and transportation. Next slide, please. So our primary area of concern is case management. I think um, Yana uh, hinted at this. Uh, we believe the success of CCS in the classic model flows from the classic medical case management model. So it aims to be proactive, to be family-centered with an assigned clinical case management professional for each child, the nurse case manager. And then with other staff, physicians, potentially social workers or others brought in as necessary. Now I'll stop there and say, as Yana indicated from her experience with a very small dependent county, not every county is able to meet this goal, but it is the goal of CCS to provide that and to ensure that kids get right care, right place, right time. When we looked at whole child model case management, and I put it in quotations just because it is a very different model than the CCS case management model. So still case management, but something very different. It's transactional rather than proactive and relational. Um, case management at the plan level typically seems to be triggered by a request from a family member or a youth asking for some kind of service that requires case management. And the plan then does assign somebody and they do work through that. And then when the issue is resolved, it's as if the case is kind of closed. It sort of goes into limbo for a while unless there's another contact. And there's, uh, and typically in our observation, there's a lack of systemic follow-up by the plans to see what happened. So it is different than the way the CCS model is organized with an identified nurse case manager who may, as, as other parents have noted, have a relationship with that particular child from birth to when they age out of the program at age 21, and they have specific expertise in children with complex medical conditions. So the way Chris tried to look at that in terms of our issue paper recognizing this as a problem was to develop a definition for CCS case, CCS case management that would establish these standard case management components specific to the CCS program that would more accurately reflect county CCS practice. So let's go to the next slide. So I decided to look at um, whole child model implementation through three lenses. So the first one is timely access to the CCS program. Do kids in whole child model have easy access to being identified as having a CCS condition and enrolled in CCS, which is the entry point to getting the additional services and care that they should be getting? The second is timely access to quality care. So do children have easy access to quality CCS care via the whole child model. I think we feel pretty confident that if children get to the right CCS panel providers, they're getting quality care. The issue is their access to those providers. And then the third point, of course, is equity. Does the whole child model really promote equity for CCS children and their families? And we all wanna be looking at everything now, all sorts of policies and their impact through that equity lens. And it's particularly important for these kids 
almost all of them are low income, about 90% are on Medi-Cal, 70% are children of color. They all are medically vulnerable. So it means there's a heavy responsibility on the CCS program and on the whole child model plan to make sure that these kids do have easy access to the pediatric care they need. So next slide. Okay, well, how does whole child model look via these three lenses? So if we look at timely access to being enrolled in CCS as the starting point, pre-COVID data. So this is data that goes back to 2018, 2019, the very beginning of 2020 before the lockdown. This is state data. Uh, indicate a significant drop in referrals to CCS and then as you would expect, lower CCS caseloads if there are lower referrals after whole child model implementation compared to classic counties. So uh, we saw increases in classic counties during that time period in enrollment and major significant decreases in whole child model counties. Uh, and the state at the time, the Department of Healthcare Services in 2019 and early 2020 acknowledged these reductions in enrollment and caseload in whole child model counties as compared to classic counties. And they asked the plans to address those reductions. So we do know that with the lockdown in 2020, COVID kind of confounded a lot of the data collection and made it a, uh, the, the data picture muddier. But I do wanna note that on Friday, the CCS advisory group was given a preliminary presentation on the whole child model evaluation that Courtney mentioned. And um, the UCSF evaluation team leader confirmed that this pattern seems to be holding post COVID, and I'm gonna quote this, whole child model counties had statistically significant lower rates of CCS enrollment compared to classic counties. So they confirmed in the evaluation that that pattern was holding. Um, let's go to the next slide. How about timely access to quality CCS care? Well, we have data that indicates that there is in fact reduced timely access, and least in some cases, to CCS services in the whole child model compared to classic counties. So as I said, counties, county CCS programs in whole child model counties still responsible once a year for doing a review of the child's medical eligibility for the program. And because they're no longer handling the case management, they depend on the whole child model plans to give them the medical records to be able to do that review. And what the counties, the whole child model counties who collected data on their experience with getting correct medical records and in a timely fashion from the plans, their experience indicates that it's difficult to get children's medical records in a timely manner from the plans. And the reason for that appears to be the plans themselves don't have easy access to the medical records. The medical records are not in fact held by the plans in the way that they are in classic counties within CCS or in classic counties, CCS staff can get access say through the children's hospitals portals to see the records. The plans can't do that. So this raises the question right off the bat of how can a whole child model plan adequately conduct medical case management with medically vulnerable children if they don't have easy access to the medical records. And then the other thing that surfaced while the whole child model plans were looking at their access to medical records to be able to determine, does this child still have this CCS condition or these multiple CCS conditions? They found that when they were able to get the records that children were often not receiving special care center visits during that previous month period. So the previous 12 months that they're doing this retro look to say, is this child still eligible? Are they still getting care? They discovered instances where children in fact had had no special care center visit during that 12 months, which is really a requirement for a child in CCS who is assigned to a special care center. And even more concerning, they found sometimes in the next year's annual medical review, that the child still did not have a special care center visit, which meant that for some of those children, they had not received a special care center visit in the whole child model context in 24 months. So again, we believe that these problems, as well as the status of 
transportation showing up as a high source of grievances for CCS parents and whole child models, that those really are flowing from this different case management approach that whole child, whole child model uses when compared to, um, to uh, classic CCS programs. I wanna mention two other things that surfaced during this preliminary review of this, the whole child model evaluation that the CCS advisory group got on Friday. Uh, we learned two very relevant um, points to case management. The first was that 10% of the families who were surveyed as part of the evaluation thought CCS services were worse than before, were worse after whole child model than in the classic setting. And of course, you're, you know, kind of your first thought is, well, 10% is not that bad, except that the evaluator commented that those particular families that reported that their children that reported less satisfaction post whole child model also reported that their children had greater specialty needs and poorer health status. So essentially, you saw that with increased medical complexity of the children, it was associated with increased dissatisfaction with the whole child model. And then furthermore, we learned that after the transition to whole child model, most parent surveys also noted that it was more difficult to access case management. They cited no direct contact with case managers. They had to navigate via a phone tree to access the right department uh, and that they, it took more time and multiple phone calls to get to services. And families also reported needing to call their county CCS offices when they were confused or they needed help. So we thought these were really important things to share with you about family perceptions of case management. So let's look at the next slide with equity. Well, um, I think we're able to demonstrate that uh, at, in terms of the reduced enrollment in, poll, uh, in whole child model compared to classic counties, that there is some indication of poor access to CCS under whole child model. And I think the examples around the annual medical review that I cited, and then this latest information from the family surveys in the whole child model evaluation lead us to think that there's at least a risk of reduced timely access to quality CCS services in whole child model compared to classic counties. So for me, if you have major differences in access and access to quality care between the two, that ultimately becomes an equity issue. And that it, it sounds like children in whole child model counties, and certainly uh, more commonly with kids with more complex needs, may actually be getting different access and poorer access in whole child model than in classic counties. And that's a classic equity issue. So let's go to the opportunities. Um, there definitely are opportunities for things we wanna be doing here. Uh, and these opportunities are things that we all can get involved in, Chris members, advocates, and obviously families who are key here. So the first and foremost thing for me is that we need to correct the problems in the current whole child model implementation. You know, we have recommendations in our Chris issue papers, other advocates certainly have made these recommendations before there's any expansion of the model. It is premature to expand whole child model until we correct what's not working in the current whole child model setting. And that's something that we owe kids and families. I think we need agreement on an implementation of a CCS case management definition. And Chris has offered one. We'd love to see those essential components of our definition included in the official state definition of CCS case management. And then that definition should be included in all the plan contract language, the all plan letters and any other policy direction for the plan so that the plans in the state can be held accountable here. Uh, next slide, please. We want, uh, we think we absolutely need to develop and implement CCS specific metrics, including clinical quality measures, and that that should hold for monitoring in both whole child model and classic counties that this should apply to all kids and the care they get regardless of where they live. We definitely think we need to, uh, to see increased state oversight and enforcement of these standards with whole child model plans. That's been a concern. I know the department is doing what it, what it can and I hope that we're gonna see 
more in enforcement and oversight as we move forward with the, the new plan contracts. Um, we obviously need to examine the whole child model evaluation report once it's, it's released. We want to see all the data, the analyses and the results. And then obviously the most important state, uh, step for us here and the biggest opportunity is we need to participate in the policy debate about the future of CCS and the whole child model. So as all the parents acknowledge, as Elena Hung talked about this morning, families are absolutely critical to this, families and youth. It's, it's their experience with CCS that's the most valuable here. And we need their experience so that we can correct what's not working with whole child model. And in general for the CCS program, give us a more effective, efficient, and family-centered program. So thanks, I'll stop there. Thank you, Lori. And I think it's really helpful to look at um, the whole child model program through the three lenses that you presented and you teed up Erin very well here <laughs> to um, talk a bit about um, policy. Go ahead. Good, good afternoon. I'm so honored to be here on this panel with so many passionate and expert leaders and family advocates in children's health. Special thank you to Daisy and Yana for sharing your personal experiences and challenges with the system. It is always tough to follow the uh, Ms. Lori Soman, uh, who is one of the most longstanding, knowledgeable, and dedicated CCS advocates that I know. The Family Voices Summit is an event that I look forward to every year I'm always leave heartened and inspired by the courage, the tenacity and dedication in the room. And I should say virtual room, right, this year. What I value most is hearing directly from families about your lived experience in caring for a child with special health care needs and hearing directly from you on the challenges and opportunities in terms of what can be done to improve the system. Know that your voice matters in these policy discussions and decisions. Allison asked me to lend the provider's perspective as it relates to challenges and opportunities facing the California Children's Services Program. I want to start by an uh, introduction to our organization. For those of you that might not be familiar, the Children's Specialty Care Coalition is a unique organization in this country. To our knowledge, it is the only association in the nation that solely represents the interests of pediatric subspecialty physicians and the families they treat. We have 18 member medical groups that are closely aligned with the majority of children's hospitals in the state, representing over 2,500 pediatric subspecialty physicians. CSCC's mission is to ensure children with youth, children and youth have timely, equitable and high quality access to care and that pediatric subspecialists are able to thrive in California's healthcare environment. One of our hallmark achievements after the organization's inception was the, two, the CCS rate increase in 2002 when access to care was in a state of crisis and was having a consequential impact in terms of health outcomes. That rate increase for CCS paneled physicians really served to stabilize the pediatric network back then. Unfortunately, we're seeing concerning trends that this sort of crisis may be looming again. Next slide. There has not been a CCS or Medi-Cal rate increase for pediatric specialty care for children's hospitals in over 10 years and for pediatric specialty physicians since 2002, despite the sharp rise in healthcare costs and inflation over the last two decades. This is slowly eroding these vital providers' ability to provide timely and high quality care. CSCC conducted an access survey of its members in 2019 that highlighted excessively long patient wait times for a number of subspecialties as well as long lengths of time to recruit specialists for open and needed physician slots at institutions across California. The demand for specialty care is outpacing the supply of those available to treat patients 
and the number of children with medical complexity is only expected to grow, in fact, double in the next decade. This issue is particularly acute for new patient referrals. We heard anecdotally from our members that COVID has only exacerbated these challenges in terms of staff burnout, early retirements, and greater cost pressures due to the high inflationary environment. Therefore, we partnered with Lucille Packard Foundation and contracted with an independent researcher, Practical Research Solutions, to re-examine the data this last November through January. The report is still being finalized, but res results show patient wait times have gotten notably longer in many specialties and are often three to six months for new patients. And this certainly doesn't meet the department's network adequ adequacy requirements of being seen within 15 business days. Additionally, physician recruitment for open slots at times is exceeding two years. When an institution is unsuccessful at recruitment, that places a greater burden on the existing physicians in that specialty and places greater risk for burnout as well as patient delays to be seen, which can have consequential outcomes. The survey also found that many specialties are anticipating significant retirements in coming years. And with long lengths of time to recruit, coupled with concerning trends of less medical students choosing to specialize in pediatric uh, specialty care, given that there's little economic incentive to do so, is a looming crisis. Pediatric subspecialists make far less than their adult counterparts and sometimes roughly the same as a primary care physician, yet they have to undergo three to five years of additional training and as a result, incur substantial student loan debt. The reduced earnings is largely due to a reliance on Medi-Cal reimbursement in pediatric specialty care, which is notably lower than Medicare, which is the main payer for adult care. These challenges are being acutely felt in California, but these trends of medical students opting out of pediatric specialization due to economics is happening across the nation and reflected in national data on unfilled fellowship slots. For some specialties, 50% of the available specialist slots are going unfilled. CSCC, in partnership with the Lucille Packard Foundation, is also working with Practical Research Solutions to triangulate the data and conduct a statewide survey on family and patient experience as it relates to access to care. We'll be working closely with Family Voices and the Family Resource Center Network in California on its dissemination later this year. Your experience with care is what resonates most with decision makers. You've heard this throughout the summit already, and we hope you will consider participating in the survey when it comes available. Uh, so now I'm going to shift gears to concerns with whole child model. As Lori spoke to earlier, whole child model implementation has been far from perfect. I often think of the saying, if it's not broke, don't fix it. C CCS had a very high family satisfaction rate before whole child model was implemented. While we can appreciate the department's intent to reduce fragmentation and shift administrative and financial responsibility to the plans to care for the whole child, we have growing concerns as it relates to the erosion of standards and specialized expertise that CCS County nurse managers provide. Children are not small adults. And as you know, the CCS population is very heterogeneous. It takes knowledgeable and pediatric trained staff to effectively manage these patients and provide high touch family centered care. Health plans are not necessarily designed to provide this level of case management and have a greater focus on preventative health and adult care overall. We also have concerns as it relates to the destabilization of the regionalized CCS network statewide. Patients in classic CCS have the ability to go anywhere in the state based on what is medically need needed 
essentially the saying, right? Right care, right time by the right provider, regardless of location. Managed care networks are largely county-based and, and more narrow in scope and typically discourage referrals of patients outside county boundaries. Lastly, as a result of whole child model implementation, children's hospitals that have experienced, have experienced a financial impact, which is related to supplemental payments and the shift of these payments from fee-for-service to managed care. And at a time when chronic underfunding of the program is already having a consequential impact, children's hospitals cannot afford losing millions of dollars a year. Children's hospitals throughout the state and nation experienced an unprecedented surge in patients this fall and winter from RSV, flu, and COVID, which resulted in extremely long wait times in emergency rooms and hospitals. There was not enough staff to meet the need and patients had to be turn, turned away at times. One of my board members who is a critical care physician said the experience this fall was life-changing and morally distressing. We need to take what the whole child model evaluation shows in terms of deficiencies, as well as the issue papers presented by Chris and other concerns raised by stakeholders and improve the current whole child model program before we consider expansion. So now shifting to opportunities. I'm pleased to share about an opp important opportunity before us. CSCC in collaboration with the California Children's Hospital Association are co-sponsoring legislation this year to address many of these challenges and concerns. SB 424, which we have coined, the CCS Modernization Act has been introduced this legislative session. It is authored by Senator Maria Elena Durazo, who represents District 26 in Los Angeles. This comprehensive bill, you can go ahead and shift to the next slide, will do the following. It will require CCS to update medical eligibility for the program to keep pace with best practices, it will update financial eligibility for the program to ensure that families with critically ill children do not, that do not qualify for CCS do not face financial catastrophe. It will make reimbursement more sustainable for physicians, clinics, and hospitals that provide CCS care. And it will require life-saving breakthrough drugs to be covered the same way regardless of whether a children is being treated in a hospital or in an outpatient clinic. And lastly, it will preserve the important case management and support services provided by the CCS program by maintaining the separation of CCS and Medi-Cal managed care that exists in current law, essentially maintaining status quo in terms of no further carbon. The bill's fact sheet and a frequently asked questions document on the bill should be available to all conference participants. And the bill is set to be heard on April 12th. I want to close by encouraging families to meet with your local legislators. Over one third of the legislature are newly elected this session. So it's important to educate them on what CCS means to you and why it's important. It cannot be underscored enough that CCS is a model program for the nation. Its existence sets the quality of care not only for CCS children, but all kids in the state. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you so much, Erin. And I just want to um, reiterate that those resources where you can learn more about SB 424 should be in the conference. Um, resource page. And um, we did get a late start, so I don't want to, um, I want to make sure we get right to you, uh, Alicia, and then we may just have a few minutes for questions and answers. And if not, we will follow up with those that don't get answered. Thank you. Go ahead, Alicia. Hi, everyone. I'm really grateful to be with you all today. Uh, my name is Alicia Emanuel and I'm a senior attorney at the National Health Law Program. 
I'm going to try to give you the condensed version here so we have time for questions. Um, we're a national nonprofit law firm that protects and advances the health rights of low income and underserved individuals and families. And we have offices in Washington, D.C., North Carolina, and Los Angeles. We engage in education, advocacy, and litigation. So I'm going to spend some time talking with you about the Medicaid continuous coverage unwinding since it's a timely topic. And then I'm briefly going to touch on a survey we just completed on the CCS program. Many of you may be aware that over the course of the COVID public health emergency, one critical protection put in place was that states could not cut people off Medicaid coverage. This was called the Medicaid continuous coverage requirement. Here in California, that important protection meant that Medi-Cal could not be cut off. And importantly, CCS coverage was also not cut off. This protection is still in place today. Uh, now you may be wondering, why, why do I need to know about this? Um, well, starting next month, uh, the state Medicaid agency will start an unwinding process that has implications for children on CCS. Um, and national studies show that one population that is at increased risk of dropping off coverage for things like not returning paperwork are children. So what are the top 10 things you should know? Um, one, since March 2020, sh children should not have been terminated from coverage. That means that uh, coverage should have been unaffected over the past three years. And the state is beginning renewals again. So um, the first terminations we may see for Medi-Cal and CCS are as early as July 1 of this year. Number two, um, make sure your contact information is updated with the county CCS office and if your child also has Medi-Cal with um, the county welfare office. Um, it's really important that the agency has your updated mailing address, phone number, and email address so that they can get in contact with you during the unwinding process. Uh, number three, find out your family or your child's annual renewal month. Um, the unwinding is happening over a 14 month period. So if you know what month your child's renewal is coming up, you can have assurances that they will still have coverage until that point. And you'll also know when you should be looking in your mailbox. Um, and then number four, um, check your mail for notices and the renewal or what's called the redetermination packets. Uh, Medi-Cal renewal packets will come in a yellow envelope so that they stick out. And we're seeking um, clarification from the department on whether they'll follow a similar tactic for CCS. Um, and remember, if you don't see anything coming in the mail, it may be because the county doesn't have your updated contact information. Next slide, please. Um, number five, we just wanna stress that if your child's CCS coverage is active, all care access through the CCS program um, is held to the federal Medicaid EPSDT standard. Um, broadly, what it means is that if a CCS medic, uh, medically necessary service, um, if a, if a, excuse me, if a CCS service is medically necessary to correct or maintain a medical condition, it must be covered by CCS. Um, and then number six, this is a special reminder for families whose child has CCS and Medi-Cal. Even if your child's Medi-Cal coverage ends during the unwinding period, then CCS care should not be disrupted. 
uh, Medi-Cal managed care plans and county CCS offices have an obligation to seamlessly transition your child's care. Um, number seven, you have the right to get notices and receive assistance in your preferred language. Um, and if your notices are coming in the wrong language, contact the county. You can also ask for interpreter assistance. Number eight, individuals with disabilities and individuals with limited English proficiency have the right to non-discriminatory assistance. State Medicaid agencies are subject to, uh, um, to compliance with non-discrimination requirements in Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act um, and other laws that I won't list now. Uh, next slide, please. Number nine, if you think your child was terminated from CCS or Medi-Cal coverage um, incorrectly, or if your child is denied medically necessary care, you have the right to appeal and file a hearing. And now that all CCS hearings have been folded into the same hearing system as Medi-Cal hearings, the information about how you can do that is listed on this screen. This is your right, exercise it. Um, and then number 10, my organization is part of the Health Consumer Alliance. The HCA is a statewide consortium of legal aid organizations that is available to help healthcare consumers access coverage and care. Um, services are free um, and we're not affiliated with the state. So our contact information and some additional resources are listed on the slide. Next slide, please. So shifting gears quickly, um, and help recently completed a CCS family engagement survey to learn more from families about their experience with the CCS program and CCS appeals. The goal is to use this feedback to improve the appeal process for CCS beneficiaries. The survey was performed in English and Spanish. We received 85 English responses and 20 Spanish responses. Next slide, please. Key takeaways I wanted to lift up. Um, families reported um, not receiving formal notices for all service denials when notices were required. Generally, families um, where the child had CCS and Medi-Cal the family was not aware of the child's Medi-Cal appeal rights. Um, some families even paid out of pocket for covered services because appeal timelines took too long. And generally, families found the appeal process to be difficult to navigate and too lengthy. Mostly, families want to see easier processes, quicker approvals, less bureaucracy, more communication, and more coordination between CCS and Medi-Cal. And this survey was generously funded by a grant from the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health in Palo Alto. Um, next slide, please. Um, I think I skipped over our, um, our needed improvements, but generally it's around families wanting more communication and more information about their rights. Um, so this slide is just some resources available to you, including some recent um, CCS publications um, that we have developed. Um, and my next slide, please. My contact information is on the last slide. Um, so back to you, Allison. Thank you so much, Alicia. Those um, 10 bits of information for families is so helpful and I appreciate you providing those additional resources. And we have exactly three minutes. Um, and I will say that the much of all the questions I've seen in the chat or in the Q and A, um, Courtney, I, I think the, the main question goes to you. There's a lot of interest around when the whole child model evaluation report may be made publicly available. Um, both to um, general public, but also um, some people at county CCS are also interested in knowing when 
that information will be made available when the report will be released. Yeah, so we're definitely going to be posting it on our website, like I mentioned in my presentation. Um, so we need to make sure it's ADA compliant, and that part takes a little bit of time. Um, so we have, of course, the final report, but it needs to be de-identified, um, as well as making it ADA compliant before posting it to the website. So we're hoping, you know, in short order, but definitely in spring of this year. And that'll be the full report. So it'll be the narrative as well as the appendices that include kind of the data um, that supports the study. Okay, thank you, Courtney. And um, just in the interest of, of our closing up, and there were a few other questions that uh, Family Voices can follow up with um, after the panel. And sorry that we got off to a little bit of a late start and aren't able to address everything that has come up. But also thank you to some people who've provided some answers in the chat and the Q&A as well. Um, but it is time to close out our session. So I wanted to thank you again, all of the panelists who presented today. Um, so appreciative for you uh, taking the time to prepare and present and share all of this important information with the Family Voices Health Summit. And um, as a reminder, there is a closing session. So please join us for the next session. I believe this window will close. And then if you go back to the Family Voices event page, you can uh, join the closing, um, the closing session, the closing keynote at that time. So thank you everybody. Um, such important information shared today and look forward to um, continued conversations. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone.